My name is Philip East. I'm on the program committee for CSTA conference. And welcome. Welcome back from lunch. Uh, if you have anything you'd want to share with somebody, I'd be happy to receive all the good news, tell all the bad news to somebody else. Okay. Uh, we have uh, with us today Pat Young Credit is going to talk to us. He has a nice bio that he wants you to read. We all want you to read. But I found out some other information about Pat uh, that you want to be sure that you know. Uh, he's already purchased his ticket to Mars. Uh, and as uh, our president said about someone else, he's not bad on the eyes. <coughs> and uh, our executive director, Chris Stevenson, hardly approves of his gender neutral name. Matt. Thank you, Philip. I asked Philip to, um, am I too loud? Am I good? I asked Philip to uh, come up with just some, some stuff, some random stuff about me. And so only two of those three things are actually true. <coughs> Which ones? Hmm. Um, but anyway, my name is Pat Jan Pradit, and I'm glad you're here. I'm happy to talk about CS Principles, of course, that I unofficially piloted this past year and uh, a course that I've grown to be very fond of. I feel like, I feel that a course like CSP, courses like CSP and courses like ECS um, are what, uh, these types of courses are, are gonna turn the tide in terms of the declining enrollment that we've been seeing in CS education, which by the way is starting to, has, has been increasing over the last couple of years actually. Um, but I think that we're not just gonna be able to uh, turn around that enrollment, we're going to be able to see enrollment in CS reach levels that we've never seen before in our nation because of courses like CSP and ECS. And so I'm, I got to control my slides. I don't really like um, just standing in one place and, and talking from a lectern. As soon as my mouse comes to me, I left my mouse in my room, I'll be able to move around and control my slides from there. Um, this project was uh, the genesis of this project is um, uh, a sponsorship between the Computer Science Teachers Association and Microsoft. So you're going to see a lot of Microsoft technologies in this curriculum because they, um, they paid for it. So um, you're going to see technologies like Excel and thank you, Excel, um, Small Basic, SkyDrive. PowerPoint, et cetera. And so the reason for that is not some type of conspiracy or anything like that. It's because Microsoft paid for it, and so there are Microsoft technologies um, in it. And uh, away we go. So what, what this curriculum is, and a little bit about what it isn't. Um, and so for the teacher, a teacher like Alfred Thompson right there in the corner, uh, it's a launch point. So how many people here are part of the phase two computer science principles pilot program? Raise your hand. One, Kelly. Great, okay. And how many people in the next two or three years envision themselves teaching computer science principles? Next two or three years. Okay, and that's probably why you're here, right? All right, uh, another, another question. Um, can anyone, let's try to do something real quick. Uh, you're going to stand up, you're going to introduce yourself, and you're going to give me one big idea. There are seven big ideas, right? Let's try to hit all seven collectively. Okay, so someone just raise your hand, I'll pick you. You just say your name and give me one of the big ideas. Yes? Internet. You have to say your name too, your name's on oh, internet. Sorry, I was looking at the internet. Oh, yeah, internet. Internet, yes, thank you. Kelly, abstraction. Abstraction, yeah. Thinking of data. Yes. Tom, um, programming? Sorry? Programming? Yes. Okay, so you have to listen. We're, we're getting to the harder ones. Recursion is a topic, but it's not a big idea. Any other ones? Okay, yes. Collaboration? Collaboration is a, a practice, but it's not one of the big ideas, seven big ideas. Bennett? Artifacts is something that you're going to create, but it's not one of the seven big ideas. Well, that's <laughs> <laughs> so, let, let, 
let's, let's talk about the seven big, big ideas. Oh, Ria, you had your chance. OK. So there, there are seven big ideas. We'll, we'll talk about them. I just wanted to do that because I just wanted to get a feel for the crowd where we're at in terms of our knowledge of the big ideas. Uh, and I won't have you guys list like the six or seven computational thinking practices. We won't go there. But this curriculum is a launch point for teachers just like you who want to, um, who, who want to offer a computer science principles experience. But you know right now that there's this, this framework with objectives and uh, you know, essential knowledge statements. And um, you're wondering, well, that's great, but it's not a curriculum. How do I actually teach this course? Like, I don't have 1,000 hours to devote to curriculum development and all that. What can, you know, what, how can I start and, and just like, get a, a jump start into this? And so this curriculum is a launch point for that. Um, but it's not an endpoint. I just want to make that clear. It's not an endpoint. It's not everything, everything, everything for 184 days. Um, but it is full experiences. So it is everything for what it is. For example, you're going to see lesson folders that I'm going to open up and show you. But it has everything. It has tests, quizzes, um, answer keys, uh, rubrics, uh, reflection documents, uh, PowerPoints, videos, etc. So for what it for what it does offer, it offers a full experience for you. And obviously, you can customize it. It's just a bunch of Word docs. It's aligned to the CSP framework, which is an important thing. It's also aligned to the CSTA framework. And what I mean by that is. It hits both. And it's less in materials, but it's not pedagogy. I just want to make that clear. It, there is no prescribed pedagogy for this. I will be talking about pedagogy, but it doesn't prescribe a, a pedagogy. It's not prescriptive in that way. Less in materials. That's what you're getting. And Microsoft Technologies, like I explained. And uh, I have a picture of Pat Phillips there. I found a picture of you, Pat. Yep, right there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Pat Phillips is the person to talk to, I guess, our uh, Microsoft liaison right now. And she can um, talk to you more about those different uh, tools and such. Um, and so what you see is Excel, Small Basic, SkyDrive, and Coded Game Lab. Uh, it's a type of 3D gaming environment. And so today, we're going to talk about how computer science principles meets the needs. We're going to talk about computation in action, which is the curriculum. We're going to go through some lesson examples. And I am a big proponent of doing. And so we're going to um, brainstorm a lesson right on the spot based off of a lesson writing guide that I'm going to show you as well. And then we'll take some questions. And actually, at the end, oh, so uh, I taught for 12 years. And I recently made a move about a month ago to code.org. I am not speaking with my code.org hat on right now. This is a, a previous curriculum project that I was um, hired to fulfill. And so this has nothing to do with code.org or anything like that or anything that we're coming out with or whatever. But the last four minutes of this presentation, I will give you guys a sneak peek into what code.org is doing and a video that we're coming out with that's going to help you. So CS Principles meets the needs. Uh, I like to use my students to tell the story about CS Principles. Here are Laura and Cassidy. They're juniors. They decided to take uh, Intro to Computer Science last year. They liked it enough, uh, so much that they took AP Computer Science, even though we know that in most states, AP Computer Science does not, is not recognized as any kind of credit. And here they are pair programming the Grid World case study. And CS Principles is designed to increase exposure to computer science. I'm going to go through this quick, because I know that you guys don't need the, the full philosophy behind it. But it's just great to start with this, the big picture. And here are Kendra and Courtney. And they're working with like circuits, with a very simple snap circuits kit. And CS Principles is designed to boost the CS job pipeline for girls just like this. And here's a picture of my. Seventh period AP computer science class, a uh, class that's it's just beautiful if you just look at them. Um, it's a class where the jocks take computer science, and those jocks happen to be girls, right in the front, right there. And, um, and, and so it's just a, a great 
hodgepodge of different, not, not just different races, but just different types of students. It was a very wonderful class. And CS Principles is designed to improve diversity in computer science. And that's a, a, obviously a main focus that we have to keep in mind in our CS Principles classes. So it's not just about programming. I think we've heard that message before. And here are the seven different big ideas. Those are the ones that we try to touch on. Uh, where programming is just one of the seven. Doesn't mean that it's one seventh of the course, it's just one of the seven big ideas. So it's not the focus of the course. What is the focus of the course though? It's, it's more than just content. I'm giving you guys, I'm showing you guys my content that I create, created today. Um, but the class is more than just content. It's about how kids learn in the end. It's about how kids learn. It's about how you teach. And it's about how computer scientists work. And what I mean by that in particular is their attitudes, their behaviors, their language, their skills, basically thinking like a computer scientist. You're not going to become a computer scientist because of computer science principles. You might have to go to a couple more classes to become a real computer scientist. But certainly kids are going to understand how a computer scientist is supposed to, you know, their, their schema for understanding the world. And so a win in this class at the end would be a kid who uh, goes to buy their prom dress and comes back the next day and tells you, you know, I was in, the, I was in Forever 21 and there were like 10 dresses that uh, I was thinking about buying and I realized I couldn't just go subjectively and just go, you know, I had to think about it computationally. And so I developed some kind of criteria to kind of, and then I created this, you know, this algorithm for, under, you know, evaluating the different dresses and, you know, thank you for teaching me computer science principles, you know. That, uh, kind of, actually, yeah, actually. Um, pe pedagogy, yeah, that would be a win. You, you get a kid coming back, that, that's a win for the course. But let, let's talk about pedagogy for the course. So the content that you're getting today, it's, it's not about pedagogy, unfortunately. It's still very important, that's why I have this slide here. There are two, basically, main approaches that most of us use, CS educators. An inquiry, kind of, like, discovery, exploratory approach to computer science, and then teacher-directed. Teacher-directed, not necessarily being always a bad thing, but you know, that's kind of what we do. And so, in terms of CS principles, what you need to think about is, what is your approach? And you need, also need to understand what instructional strategies kind of work best with your approach. Now, I suggest an inquiry kind of exploratory approach. Um, research has shown that an inquiry kind of exploratory collaborative approach is just better for the types of populations that we're trying to include in our classroom. But that doesn't mean that a teacher-directed approach doesn't have its place. That's my talk about CS principles pedagogy. And obviously the key here is computational thinking. Here are the computational thinking practices. And so these are the ways you show computational thinking. That's the difference between computational thinking and a computational practice. A practice is how you show that you are computationally thinking. And these are the six computational practices in the computer science principles framework. Now let's get into the actual course. Um, it's called computation in action because obviously it's about computation, which is the way we formulate um, problems and solve them using an information processing agent. And that agent could be a computer, it could be many things. Um, but it's called computation because it's about, this course is about computation, but in turn it's about action, like kids actually making real things that are relevant to their lives. And so using that computation to kind of get at things that are relevant to them. And that's the action piece. Um, and that might even mean social action in terms of impacting their communities. And so here are just some snapshots of uh, the different um, lessons. Over here on the left side, you see um, uh, images of um, vectors being created using different functions, and those vectors being combined to create a, a simple line drawing. Uh, in that lesson, students are learning about um, vector drawings versus bitmap drawings. 
and they're understanding the difference, and, and then they're creating their own vector drawing. Um, in the middle right there, top middle, you see a, an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, students in that lesson are, um, they are computing um, their own social network. And this is based off of a TED Talk, a very famous TED Talk. So they're computing their own social network and creating a data visualization of that social network. Uh, in the bottom middle, you see a screenshot of a, a concussion app. And so um, I firmly believe in couching all of the computational artifacts in something that like, actually matters. And so um, instead of just creating um, a text box GUI kind of something to calculate whatever um, that might not be important to them, uh, if there are a lot of football players in your room, you might want to think about uh, having them program a concussion app or lots of kids who just are really into shoes these days. Uh, there are a lot of kids who are into shoes these days, usually boys, oddly enough. But um, you could have them rate shoes. And so that's what that program is about. In the top right corner, uh, that's a picture of Mario. And there they're learning about encoding pixels and, and bits and stuff like that. In the bottom right hand corner, that's a, a visualization of a social network right there. That, they're going to create. And so we're going to dive deeper into what's inside this curriculum. So this is the structure of the curriculum. There are four units, and they cover all seven big ideas. And that's how they're grouped. Algorithms, programming as an expression of creativity. That's unit two. Algorithms is unit one. Unit three, data and abstraction. And unit four, the internet and impact. Uh, you might find other ways to kind of group the different big ideas, but that's just kind of what made sense to me. Uh, the Word docs that you can find when you download this curriculum, and it's available on the CSTA website. Those Word docs right there kind of just are overview docs of the entire course. And so on the right side, you see the nine lesson experiences that you'll find there right now. These are preview experiences. They're not in any kind of particular order. They are in the units. Um, the units are in a particular order, but in terms of the lessons themselves, they're not like the first lessons in those particular units. They're just preview lessons to kind of help, help teachers kind of understand what they're going to get in terms of curriculum come the fall. So this curriculum is still in development, and uh, many more lesson experiences will be added. What you're getting today is just a preview. Still to come, tutorial videos, uh, explicit calling out of computational thinking within the lesson. So you can think of that as like highlight boxes or call outs of computational thinking and even how to assess computational thinking with your students. That's something that we don't computationally think about much, like the assessment of computational thinking. And so that's going to be called out a little bit more, like how do you know your students are computationally thinking? You don't just throw something at them and because you designed it to, you know, to elicit computational thinking, it just works. You have to assess it somehow, right? So that's, gonna, that's more to come. Um, more lessons. Social network computation, that's not in the preview package right now on the website, but that's actually on my website. I just finished it like a week or two ago, and so it didn't make it into the CSTA package, but it's on my website along with everything else. Uh, a lesson on metadata, a lesson on websites, a lesson on data analysis, a lesson on programming and small basic, and more connections to art and music. So that's still to come. And so let's dive deeper into social network computation. Pick up this microphone. And let me explain what you're going to get with social network computation. All right, so I'm going to talk about two particular lessons and kind of explain what you should expect as a teacher and kind of um, how to teach it. So in this lesson, Students are going to collect data about their classmates. And the first thing they're going to do is they're going to um, just think about what does it mean to be a friend to someone else? Like, what does a connection mean? And so they're going to look at that qualitatively. And then because of that experience, they're going to understand that somehow, some way, in order to compute it, they're going to have to quantify it somehow. And so they're going to create a formula for uh, quantifying a connection between two people using certain bits of data, certain criteria that they decide on their own. 
That could be the number of texts that they send uh, back and forth between a particular person. So, like, you know, do I have a connection with Jim? And so I can think, well, let me think of how many texts I send back and forth with Jim and our hours of interaction total. And so with that, I'm going to create some kind of formula to compute that and then, and then determine some type of threshold that, that signifies whether I'm a friend with Jim. Do I have a connection with Jim? And so after that, they collaboratively, using SkyDrive, and that's what I'm showing right here, you can create um, Excel workbooks in SkyDrive for free. And so if you don't have Microsoft Office downloaded on your computer, you can just use it within the browser. And you can work collaboratively online, uh, filling in this data like spreadsheet together. And when I say together, the entire class works together. So 30, 32 kids work together to kind of fill out this huge spreadsheet. This is not big data. Uh, this is, you know, I was in a CSP uh, session earlier today, and I think Baker was talking about how we need to scaffold uh, the learning before students take on a performance-based task. So this type of lesson is like a, a kind of beginner, intermediate kind of experience in prep for that performance-based task, that data performance-based task, which will involve a larger piece of data and probably metadata and things like that. And so this is just handling very clean kind of data that they're very used to, numbers in a spreadsheet data table format. So after they do that, they, they uh, work with Excel and create some formulas in Excel. You know, you can actually program it in Excel. You can have conditions and stuff like that. And so they do use conditional formatting to make uh, the, the students who actually have connections with one another, they, they format the cells and make them pink. So very simple conditional statement in, in um, Excel. And after they, they do that, they create a data visualization, but there's a connection to the math common core here. And so what you're gonna see in some of these lessons are a connection beyond CS standards, like the CSP framework and uh, the CSTA standards, but you're also gonna see math, math connections, um, uh, literature connections and such. And so with this particular lesson, after they create the data visualization, they're going to uh, come up with a question about their social network, and then they're going to investigate that question, and then they're going to do some statistics. They're going to calculate a correlation coefficient. Um, they're going to uh, you know, find a line of best fit, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what it looks like inside that folder. So this is what you would get as a teacher. Because remember, this entire curriculum, it's about a launch point for you. It's a help for you. And so to help you along, there are three lesson documents. Because this experience right here is, I think, it lasts about 11 or 12 days. And most of these project folders last from like three all the way to like eight or nine days. And so they're not like clean 45-minute lessons or anything like that. because you know what, when you work with projects and, 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 and relevant kind of learning, things aren't clean, things aren't closed after 45 minutes. And so uh, there are three lesson documents split up. There's, a, there's you know, a starter PowerPoint for kids to create their social network visualization, test with answers, and then there's Excel spreadsheets showing the development of the the spreadsheet as kids go along so you understand what kids are supposed to be creating, an activity doc, um, and even uh, some exemplars as well so that you understand what kids, what, what these products are supposed to look like. And that's inside the social network uh, computation folder. Um, another project I want to highlight is the concussion app. The concussion app um, by the way, the social network computation lesson, that gets at online collaboration and things like that. The concussion app uh, gets at um, uh, the programming, the, the, it's, it's a lead into the programming portfolio task, but it's also, it's not just there just for programming, um, it gets at some math pieces as well. 
we'll, we'll talk about that. That's what that formula is there for. Um, so what you see here is the context. Um, uh, boxers, football players, whatever, they all suffer from concussions. How do we rate the severity of a concussion? You know, how do we know whether a football player should go back to playing, you know, just go back the next day or the next hour or whether they should be held back? What if you don't have a doctor? Well, let's, you know, let's imagine that you had an app for that as well, which you probably shouldn't depend on, but you know, let's say you could create an app for that. And so students in this lesson are creating an app for that. They research the factors that are used to diagnose a concussion, and then they pick four of the most significant factors and create a very simple text box GUI kind of thing in small basic to rate a concussion. And so with that, I want to show you a little demonstration of small basic so you understand what the main programming tool kind of looks like. Small Basic is a free download. You can find that at smallbasic.com. It is a textual programming language, so it's not like Scratch or Alice. It's a great middle ground between Scratch and Alice and something more complicated like Visual Basic or Java. And so this is the environment. This is what you get. It's a very simple looking environment. I'm going to open up a previously made program. And by the way, if you guys have any questions at any point, just raise your hand. All right. Let me blow that up. So I'm going to show you some features of Small Basic. Now, obviously, you don't need to use Small Basic, but I needed to use it. <laughs> and so here it is. And even, even outside of Microsoft-funded context, I think it's very worthwhile in terms of introducing students to a a textual programming environment, te just textual programming period. I think you, uh, you can do that. Let me make it a little bit bigger. And I'm going to comment out. I'm going to comment out the lines so that you can see them in action one by one. And I'm just going to highlight the different features of this language. So first, commenting. Just one. Single quote. There you go. Okay, graphics window dot background color equals red. So press F5. That's how you run stuff here. There's no compilation. Yes, question. Is small basic platform compatible? Yes. So um, it if you um, boot up Windows in a Mac environment, <laughs> you can use small basic, but no. Yeah, you can't. You can't run this, yeah. So it will work under bootcamp? Sorry? It will work oh, yeah, under totally. Under bootcamp? Mm -hmm. Yep. <coughs> Parallels, etc. cetera. Um, graphics window dot background color equals red. And that's what it looks like. It pulls up a graphics window and makes it red. It's a very simple line. And if I didn't want to make the background color red, I could have made it white. But check this out. This is called IntelliSense. Those of you guys who are familiar with Visual Studio, raise your hand. It's the same thing here. You know, in fact, if you have a Visual Basic or C Sharp course right now, this is a great lead-in to that course. And so IntelliSense. So it gives students kind of API help right in the, uh, right in the environment. And so I can change the title of my graphics window if I want and call it CSTA example. And you can go from there. Small Basic is not object-oriented. What I mean by that is you cannot create classes and objects of your own design. You have to use their stuff. And so basically, you're attacking programming from a procedural point of view, which is very simple for beginners. All right. Small Basic also has turtle art, just like Logo and many other environments and languages. And so here is, here are two lines showcasing turtle movement. Uh, there's a property called speed. I make it equal to 10. Notice there's no semicolon. Notice there's no kind of extraneous kind of code statements as well, like method headers or et cetera. So let me press F5. Now we have a turtle, and it moves pretty quickly. 
All right. So it has turtle art. What else does it have? It can play music. Let's press F5. Can people hear that? All right. It has buttons for GUIs. Let's take a look at that. There's the click name. Let's click it. And so you see just with one very simple line of code, you're getting a lot, a lot is happening. Let me comment this sound line out. All right, here are a couple more controls. So I'm gonna change the size and, actually let me just take all this away. So the rest of this stuff right here is, uh, I'm creating an event, it's called button clicked, right there. And when it's raised, it calls on the clicked subroutine, which is right here and it makes the turtle move another 10 pixels. Press F5, I click it. And so very simple lines of code to you know, affect some pretty fantastic things. And that's just, a, just a, you know, about 20% of what's really cool about Small Basic. Any questions about this? It's downloadable free. Yep. Well, I just wanted to say, I, I did use it in my class in my first computer science sequence, and um, there's plenty of examples online, too. Um, you can actually publish um, and have your students publish what they're doing, and they can all share amongst yep. each other. I was about to show that. Yeah, Thanks, Thomas. Cool. All right, so some other features of the IDE itself. You can publish to the web. And so I think I'm connected to the web right now. No, I'm not. I'm not going to even try. I'm not going down that road. <laughs> but when you press publish, all right, well, let's see what happens. Press publish. OK. Well, a box would show up that, that gives you the link to the server. And you, you click on it, and your program shows up in a browser. Really cool. Just one, one click, five seconds later, it's in the browser. You can share it with the entire world. Very useful for online collaboration, because you can see the code as well. Um, we talked about Visual Basic. What happens if I press the graduate button? It creates a Visual Basic file out of this small basic. So it's just a great lead into a Visual Basic uh, class. All right. And so inside this folder, you'll find the sample program, uh, a PowerPoint that kind of leads students through the experience, uh, a rubric, a reflection document. We talked about. Um, you know, the, the performance-based tasks um, ask students to reflect on the experience. And so this particular lesson is designed to help them understand what reflection is all about. And there's a rubric that goes with that as well. And you might be able to find some exemplars online. Now, yeah, Pat. Hey, is it possible to show the results of that, that app? Of that app? Show it in action? Um, Yes, it's just typing into a box. I'll have to pull it up. Small basic open, yep. It doesn't have the picture background because the picture is in a different folder, but you know, you type into it, let's, let's see here, vomit, a lot of vomit, nine. Balance, four, drowsiness, six, memory, two, evaluate, concussion rating, 49. So something very simple like that. And you can add to that as well. This is just a very basic um, example of the program. All right, now inside the folder. All right, now, here's the thing. Um, not everything is going to be given to you come fall 2013. You obviously are going to want to and probably have to create your own materials. Now, those of you guys who have never written um, CSP lessons are probably wondering, where do I start? So now that you have the, 
the um, example lessons to kind of like wrap your brain around, like how do you create your own lessons? Well, rather than just, you know, give you fish, I'm going to talk a little bit about how do you create a CSP specific lesson. So eight steps to a CSP lesson. Mm. Start with the content. What do they need to know, obviously? And what that means is the standards and uh, objectives of the CSP framework. Next, think about the computational thinking practice that you want students to learn. This is not, this is not like what do you need to know. This is like what do you want them to learn how to, what, how to do, how to think. Like kind of like creating artifacts. Yes, right, in the end. It's a great. Um, and, and then the third step is to skip right to the end and think about how am I going to evaluate this. You know, we as computer science teachers sometimes dig our own graves. We, we come up with this awesome project, we write, write up the assignment, but then we never think about in the end how are we going to actually grade it. And then we're left like grading for like hours and like, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys have been there. I've been there many times. So, uh, eight steps to a CSP lesson, you need to think about how you're going to evaluate it right from the beginning. So how do you confirm that they learned it? And what I'm talking about there is not like the actual product, but the actual evaluation of the product. So create the rubric or the answer key first. And then create the activity. How do they show they learned it? And then create your lesson instructions. So how do I get them to the point of being successful on that final evaluation? And then start to fill it in. You know, start thinking about other people other than yourself. Uh, what resources do, do other, other folks need to implement the lesson? Kind of, you know, include some links or resources or whatever. Um, wrap up the lesson doc with a title, a summary, an outline. And then reflect. Actually think about, was this a good lesson? Even before you give it to students, and then you'll reflect again, so does this meet the objectives that I was trying to get at? Reflect. Eight steps to a CSP lesson. This is provided in a separate PowerPoint. And this is just good for folks who are kind of creating curriculum for their counties, their districts, et cetera. Just a, some kind of guide to help you along. A little bit more about lesson planning. All right. These are the 11 items in, a, in my CSP lesson document package. Title, time, uh, duration, uh, what prior knowledge students need, overview, objectives, guiding questions, resources, lesson outline, lesson instructions, the assessment, the rubrics, and finally the standards at the bottom because they're long and lengthy and you don't want them at the top. But in constructing a CSP lesson, you don't just go top to bottom, you do it out of order. So you start with the standards first and think about, you know, what do you want to get at? And then you go from there. And then you, the green, 8, 9, 10, 11, then you come up with a, a title. And then you think about the prior knowledge and write an overview. And you think about how long it takes. I don't like thinking about, I don't like constraining myself to a certain time period right off the bat. All right. And so specifically, we talked about content. And so I just took an example from the CSP framework right here. Um, what do they need to know? You need to pick a learning objective, an essential knowledge statement. That's a, some new terminology that will be coming out this week. Um, and so I've, I've, this is your, maybe your first peek at this new terminology. Um, if you're familiar with the CSP framework that's available on the CS Principles website, just know that 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 will be made more specific come this week. Um, and so this is a, an essential knowledge statement. And there are bullet points below every single essential knowledge statement in the new framework. This is one of the bullet points. And this is an essential question. How are different instructions in an algorithm selected? That kind of comes from the essential knowledge statement. This is the question that students can ask, that you can ask students to kind of drive their learning. And that's where you craft the essential guiding questions. And so this is the content piece of constructing a lesson. And remember, again, this is all available in a separate PowerPoint just by itself. So I'd imagine folks sitting down at a computer, kind of pulling up the PowerPoint, having the lesson framework, I mean, the uh, CSP framework right next to them, and kind of using them in tandem. Computational thinking, you know, what do they need to learn to do? And 
you know, this is just number two in the list of computational thinking practices, developing computational artifacts. And um, <coughs> here, specifically, it means to use appropriate algorithmic and information management principles. So, without further ado, I want you guys to start thinking about creating your own CSP lessons. So just with a little bit of help that I've given you so far, rather than you know, take it and then think about lesson planning in August, let's do some lesson planning right now. And we're gonna do a little pair lesson planning. And so uh, what's gonna happen here is um, you're gonna get together with someone who's very close to you, just one other person. And you're going to use this EK, this essential question, and this computational practice, and you're going to step through. You're just going to brainstorm. You're just going to talk about it. You can write it up if you want. If you come up with a really good idea, you might want to write it down. But I want you to step through these eight steps in creating a CSP lesson and just kind of talk it through. Content in computational thinking-wise, one and two, I've already provided it up there. But in terms of evaluation, I want you and your partner to think about, well, you know, so how are we going to evaluate that content? What does the product look like? And are we going to use a, a rubric? Is it going to be a checklist? How do we actually grade this product? Number four, activity. Okay, so then what is the activity? What will the handout look like? Number five, instruction. How do we help students get to being successful on that final product? What are the resources other teachers might need to teach this lesson? Come up with a title, and then at the end, and we'll do this, we'll do this maybe for like five, six minutes, and then I want to hear ideas from the crowd. And then I want you guys to reflect and think, okay, so that idea that we came up with, is that actually going to meet the objectives that, well, that I picked up there? All right? So why don't we do that for the next five minutes? Just meet someone next to you and kind of just step through those eight steps using using that uh, essential knowledge statement question and computational thinking practice. All right, let's wrap up our conversations. And I'd love to hear what you guys came up with. Anyone willing to share what type of product would get at assessing whether a student met these objectives. What type of product? And then how would you evaluate that product? Let's start with that. So that's uh, points, steps three and four. Yes. A question. Yep. Yes. Uh, you can focus on either. So all four are just one. Uh, I just picked one right there because uh, I didn't have enough space for all four. You can do all four, you can do one. Fine. So whatever idea you came up with, whether for one or four, I'd love to hear it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how would you evaluate whether a student now understands that selection uses a Boolean condition, et cetera, et cetera. A variety of inputs yeah. into a conditional statement? Yeah. Okay. I'm not, sure. oh, I'm not gonna make a judgment here. <laughs> I just wanted to hear people's ideas, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Yes? Okay. So using if statements, I guess? Yeah. All right. Anyone think of something non programming? Rebecca? Rebecca actually brought up a good point. A lot of these objectives can be intertwined with the other objectives that are outside the big idea as well. So that's something to keep in mind as you're developing your curricula. 
You don't have to stay within a big idea. You can mix them up together. Any other ideas as to how to get at this? Yes? Lots more ideas. Okay. Yes? One thing I've tried is have them create a scoreboard for a game. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes the game changes on certain conditions. When is the game over? What is your iteration? Um, that sometimes works. It could be, it could be a, like a real game, like a basketball scoreboard, or you mm -hmm. could actually make it. Uh, one, one thing I tried once was a Monopoly scoreboard. Basically, people are. Thank you. And one last one, yes, back there. Looking at knitting patterns. Explain. Well, because there's the sequences that there's a little short at the end that you can do this number of stitches and that number of stitches, and then you repeat for a certain number of times, and then depending on where you are in the garment, you can do it different. I'd love to see kids knitting <laughs> in a computer science class. <laughs> do you actually do that? Yeah, right now. Oh, yeah. Okay, one last one, yes? What is the level? So in terms of grade or in terms of sequence, like where it fits in with a... So how deep to go? Brooke, do you have any ideas about that in terms of depth? Like how deep to go? I don't think it's prescribed here. Uh, well, yeah, I guess yeah. it really depends where this falls in, you know, on your calendar, where this mm -hmm. falls in terms of carrying other big ideas or other learning objectives. Uh, I think you might see it pop up many times, and you could just build on it at a basic level and then just kind of take it all the way throughout the course. You don't just touch it once and then and that's it, check it off and you're done. And I think when you speak to teachers who use that approach where you sort of circle back and, and you're building on prior knowledge and like forming those connections for your students and they're forming those connections for themselves, uh, I, I think those teachers will sort of tell you that, that the different levels of rigor and the different levels of depth that you reach kind of natural. I was going to interrupt. So before we uh, take 
a couple questions, and then I show you a, a video, a little sneak peek of what code.org is doing, a different hat, totally different than what I just showed you right there. Um, I just want to quickly summarize. Computer science principles meets the needs. It's awesome. I mean, that's just the way to kind of explain it. I don't need to kind of get into that anymore. Um, number two, computation action. That's this curriculum right here. Computation, the computation piece, but in action, actually making like relevant projects. We talked about, uh, we, we went through two lesson examples. We went through social network computation. That in, also involves some kind of, some math and statistics as well. And we also looked at uh, just a very traditional programming kind of uh, project, but couched within a, a relevant context. We looked at how to write a CSP lesson, and that's a separate PowerPoint available um, on my website, which I'll give you the link to right now. So are there any questions before I show you this uh, short video? Yes, Bennett. So um, it's cool that you, you know, said teachers will be encouraged to add to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Bennett. Pat, could I do um, a follow-up on that on top? Because one thing I was wondering is, I don't see any licensing on it right mm -hmm. now. Would there be any chance of putting it on GitHub and then allowing teachers to fork it and use GitHub as something? I mean, you guys can just do whatever you want with it. You can say it's made by Jake Youngfratted if you want to. Yeah. I mean, that's fine by me. Uh, but yeah, it's totally free for folks to just kind of use and mess with as much as possible. In terms of, Bennett, your question in terms of like, uh, follow up with this and other folks adding on to it. I think that's a great idea. In terms of my role, my role is finishing with it like as soon as possible because I'm not doing that anymore. I have a different job now. Uh, so I don't know, Bennett. I don't know what, what Microsoft wants to do with it if they just want to keep it static and that's it or kind of add to it. Does that answer your question? It does. I guess I have a follow on question, which is how it relates to professional development. All right, that's a great question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I should have touched on that earlier. So I talked about how this doesn't prescribe a pedagogy. What I meant to say is it doesn't, there is no professional development for it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's lesson plans. It's, it's, it is what it is. It's lesson plans that help you guys get started. It's a launch point for creating your own CSP curricula. It is not a program. It's not... Uh, a movement or anything is a launch point. Yes? Um, a little off topic uh, about code.org. Um, because of the data that you all put on code.org, yeah. are you able to add more programming classes? Are you able to try and get more programming classes? That's awesome. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Make sure to clap for Hadi when he speaks tonight, I mean uh, today. Um, he was the genesis of all that. So now a video preview from code.org. So nothing related to this anymore. What is code.org up to? That's my family. Um, code.org, um, of the many things that we are up to, we are also um, gonna be creating curriculum resources for teachers to use in their classroom, no matter what computer science class they're teaching. So this particular, and we're gonna use famous people because kids respond to famous people, right? You can say something, but if Chris Bosch says it, oh, then they listen. So um, this is a video. Um, is there an audio connection here? Maybe I'll just jack this up. All right. You try the podium like you put on the ground if you put it through speakers. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nat Brown. I was uh, one of the original founders and inventors of the Xbox at Microsoft back in 1999. One of the things I think is really cool about computers um, is thinking back about how computers came to be. I, I have an old circuit board that I got at Boeing Surplus that used to be part of, maybe it was part of an old airplane or something, but it's just gigantic. And I, I show it to kids and they say, wow, is that an old computer? And I say, well, sort of, but it's a, it's a computer 
it used to compute things, but it, it wasn't like what we have today. It's not a programmable computer. It was a, a circuit that was laid out by hand that converted electrical signals of one shape into electrical signals of another shape. So it, it, um, it was a computer. They were called analog computers. But something really dramatic happened um, at the dawn of the programmable computer era. And it's still happening right now. Um, it, what's happening is that we, we kind of settled on this architecture for how we deal with not just these crazy big electrical signals and electricity, but we decided that what we should do is convert most of the signals that we see from the outside world when we're working on them with computers, we're going to convert them into numbers. We're going to convert them into binary. Video game consoles, when they first came out, were really crazy specialized pieces of hardware. Programming a video game console, if you were writing back in the 80s and even the early 90s, you weren't really programming a very easy to use computer. Well, that changed. At Microsoft, one of the things that we said aha about, we said, um, it turns out that PCs are getting good enough at playing games, the Xbox should really be under the covers, it should just be a PC. And so that's what we did. We built a game console that was just as much a PC as it was a game console. The side of the Xbox so is just a computer. And, At the back, there's a, a big a connector PC. where the power comes in. Um, this thing right here is, is a heat sink, and it's just on top of the central processing unit and the graphics processor, and it keeps it cool because your, your Xbox is such a powerful computer that it generates a lot of heat. The little tiny microchip inside so now imagine a student, you know, imagine you, well, you, uh, you could just kind of pop up a PowerPoint about um, computer hardware, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe you've done that in the past. I know I have. Um, or you could show this video uh, where the Xbox, the, one of the people who actually made the original Xbox is talking about how the Xbox uh, originated and, uh, and how it's really just a, a specialized PC. And so Code.org is going to come out with a series of these videos for you to use in your, just kind of like weave in into your different curriculums and um, along with lots of other materials as well. I think Hadi's going to be talking about that today.